Good morning. Welcome to Church Online at Lakes Baptist. We've been enjoying a series from Mark that Pastor Mike has been teaching. Jesus wasn't anything like they were expected, was he? And sometimes I find myself wondering what would he be like if he turned up here today? Would we even recognize him? Food for thought. I hope you enjoy our service this morning. The story of Christmas, Jesus is born. This is Mary. Hi! You see, Mary was the mother of Jesus, but before that happened, she lived in the town of Nazareth. And she was engaged to marry a man named Joseph. Hey, -o. Hi, Joseph! Ooh, got it. Mary got pregnant by the power of God. Hey, huh? Joseph didn't understand all this at first, but an angel came and told him to still take Mary as his wife. Yeah, okay. So he did as the angel said. 
Not long after that, the ruler of the land, Caesar Augustus, wanted to count how many people were in the land. So Caesar Augustus ordered everyone in the land to travel back to their hometowns so that they could be counted. Joseph's hometown was Bethlehem, so Mary and Joseph traveled from Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, they looked for a place to stay. Now I'm sorry. Oh, man. But there was no room for them. Uh, what about her? Um, okay. So they stayed in a barn, and while they were there, Mary gave birth to Jesus. Oh. <laughs> she wrapped him snugly in the strips of cloth. Uh, that'll work. And laid him in a manger. Excuse me. And so the Son of God, the Savior of the world, was born in a barn in Bethlehem. Silence falls, I hear you call in the secret place. You still my soul with quiet joy, and I'm wide awake. In the middle of the night, I look up to the sky, I can hear you. this 
2020 has certainly been a challenging year in so many different ways for so many of us. I reckon one of the most challenging things has been having to constantly hear about sickness, about pain, about suffering, and about death. We've had to hear more about emotional suffering, financial struggles, family separation, mental health challenges, disease and death this year more than most of us have in our lifetime. Nobody likes to have these conversations about suffering or pain because they help uh, they make us feel helpless. Uh, they leave us longing for hope, uh, yearning for peace, security, and abundant life. Well, the final parts here of uh, the book of Mark that we're going to cover both today and next week, will reveal betrayal, loss, great loss, immense pain, incomprehensible suffering, and yes, even death. It's okay if it makes us want to look the other way or uh, it makes us want to look away or it forces us uh, to look for hope, to long for something more because the end of the story you will find is one of great hope and great promise. This week we will see Jesus arrested, put on trial, and sentenced to death. We will see those closest to him fall away and hide in shame. Next week we will see Jesus crucified, dead, and buried. But the story ends with Jesus alive for all to see and ascending to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. This is a story of sacrifice. It is a story of hope. It is a story of love. It is a story of salvation, a story of a gift. God giving his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sin, my sin, your sin, and then raising him to life again, offering to anyone who accepts it eternal life. Let me just begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for the precious gift of your word and for opportunities to work our way through it together as your church. Help us, Lord, to be faithful stewards to your word, to read it every day, to follow and to allow your spirit to guide our hearts, draw us ever closer to you. Teach us more of you and your great love for us and help us to live that out in our everyday lives. Be your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to Mark chapter 14. We'll be looking in uh, Mark chapter 14 and some in Mark chapter 15 today. And so keep your copy of uh, God's Word open there. Mark chapter 14, beginning verse 43 to 52. I'm not going to read this for you. I'll just kind of talk about this a little bit. This is where Jesus is betrayed and arrested. You'll remember that Judas, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus had conspired with the Sanhedrin, some of the, the high court there, and the, the Jewish religious leaders. Judas had inspired, conspired with them to betray Jesus for uh, some money. And so he worked out a signal that uh, the man he kisses, uh, greets with a kiss, which is a common greeting in that uh, time and that culture, the man he greets with a kiss will be Jesus, and they are to arrest him. And so Judas goes up 
uh, and approaches Jesus. Jesus has just been praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas comes up with this crowd of people with clubs and swords with him. So this is not a small matter, is it? This isn't just Jesus going up with these religious leaders and betraying Jesus. This is Judas going up with soldiers that were sent by the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Uh, this crowd of people with clubs and swords accompany Judas and some of the Sanhedrin to arrest Jesus. And in fact, it, it becomes a little violent there for a little while. One of the soldiers starts to arrest Jesus, and one of the men who was there with Jesus takes a sword and cuts off the ear of the soldier, or a piece of his ear. Now, we're not sure who that man is from, from Mark's gospel, but John's gospel, chapter 18, verse 10, uh, says that it was Peter who took a sword and took a swing at this soldier whose name was Malchus. Now, Malchus, he, Peter was probably swinging for his head, and Malchus took a, a duck, uh, but Peter still cut off a piece of his ear. Jesus walks up to Malchus then and heals his ear. <sighs> what an amazing story. Then the way they came for Jesus is like something that it's a way that they would come for someone who was an insurrectionist or a murderer, uh, someone who was a common thief or someone who was a real troublemaker. But Jesus says to them, I was always with you in the temple and the community. The Sanhedrin, he says, I was with you all the time. You could have arrested me uh, peacefully, but you come to me with swords uh, in this way. And then Jesus says, but you've come to me this way so that Scripture will be fulfilled. Well, what is that talking about? Well, I'll tell you. It's talking about Isaiah 53, verse 12, that says, He was numbered among the transgressors. Zechariah 13, 7 says, They will bring a sword against my shepherd, and my sheep will scatter. And verse 50 uh, definitely says that. So this is as they're resting Jesus. Verse 50 says, All those who were with Jesus, everyone who was with him, deserted him and fled. Absolute abandon. They left him. Verse 51 and 52 is a little story only told in Mark, which talks about the, the craziness of that scene and, and the, uh, the, the kind of violent scuffle that was taking place. And uh, Mark describes a man who was not wearing any underwear. He was not wearing anything under his robe, which was not very common. Uh, commonly, he'd wear undergarments and then the robe. This man was only wearing a robe, and when, he, when Jesus was arrested, he tried to get out of there. Someone grabbed his robe, and he got that thing off there. He got out of there and had to flee naked. Now, only Mark tells the story, and it's believed, commonly believed by theologians that uh, this man who uh, he's talking about was probably Mark himself. Like he's saying, I was there. I saw this happen. Interesting story, isn't it? But Jesus then is brought before the Sanhedrin, this um, uh, kind of a high court, uh, the religious leaders. It was the chief priests, uh, the teachers of the law, and the elders make up the Sanhedrin. And in chapter 14, verses 53 to 65, we see a story of Jesus being brought before this Sanhedrin. And they were looking for any evidence they could to try to kill Jesus, to put him to death. But they couldn't find anything. He had never done anything wrong. In fact, they had a number of witnesses that brought false statements against, against Jesus, but none of these statements matched, and so they couldn't use those. They had to throw those out. Then they had people starting to stand up and giving testimony, saying, this man said he's going to destroy the temple, and in three days he's going to build it back himself. But even their own testimonies didn't match, and so it wasn't enough. And the, one of the chief priests uh, sorry, the chief priest then asked Jesus, are you not going to respond to any of these accusations? You haven't said anything yet. And Jesus remained silent. The high priest then looks to Jesus and he says, look, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And Jesus replies, I am and you will see the Son of Man, which is Jesus. You will see Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, uh, of, sorry, the right hand of the mighty God, and coming in clouds of heaven. Now at this, the high priest tore his, his, his clothes or his outer garments, which is a sign of, of mourning, a sign of torment. And he accused Jesus of blasphemy. Now what is that about? Well, the, the word for blasphemy in the Old Testament always meant an insult to God. In the New Testament, actually, in these times, it actually could be uh, uh, mocking or degrading of anyone. But uh, in, in this particular case, you know, John thir uh, 10, 33 says, it's because they're saying you, who's being human, 
claim to be God. You're claiming to be something that is impossible to be. You could not be God. And so by claiming the nature of God, Jesus was committing blasphemy. And they said, you've heard it right here. We don't need any other testimony. You've heard it. This man says the impossible. He says he is God. He is God's son. And they immediately, everyone who was there, condemned Jesus to death. Some of the crowd coming, started coming up, and they spat on Jesus. I don't know if you've ever had that happen before. I have, and, and I, I um, found it very challenging not to strike back. If someone comes up and spits in your face, it's ultimate insult. And the first instinct is to take a swing. But Jesus remained silent. Jesus didn't fight back. As men came up and they spat on him, then they blindfolded him and they started punching Jesus and punching him, saying, tell me, prophet, who was it that hit you? And then guards took Jesus away and continued to beat him. Then we find a story of Mark chapter 14, verse 66 through 72. How Jesus' prediction about Peter comes true. You see, if you remember uh, earlier in chapter 14, verses 27 to 31, Jesus has a conversation with Peter, doesn't he? He says, Peter, you're going to deny me. Peter says, not me. Not me. I will fight for you. I will stand by you. And Jesus says, oh, Peter, before the rooster crows the second time, in the, uh, before the rooster crows in the morning, you will have denied three times that you even know me. And Peter says, not me, Jesus. I will die for you. Well, here we see a story as Jesus is standing before the Sanhedrin. So when Jesus was arrested, Peter fled. He got out of there. And when Jesus is taken up to the Sanhedrin, Peter watches from a, a nearby court or a distant courtyard. And while he's warming himself by the fire in the courtyard, a young girl who's, uh, who's a servant of the high priest comes up and she recognizes Peter. And she says, hold on, you're with him. You're with Jesus. And Peter says, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not the man you're, you're thinking about. And then um, some others come up to him. Uh, some of the crowd that he's talking to him said, you, you are, you are, uh, you are Jesus. You're one of those guys. And again, it denied him again. I said, I don't know Jesus. I'm not with Jesus. Then the crowd started saying to Peter, you are a follower of Jesus. And Peter got really upset. And he said, he's not with Jesus. And in verse 72, if you look at that, it says, Immediately after that third denial, immediately the rooster crowed and Peter remembered the words of Jesus. I bet he did. And Mark's gospel says Peter broke down and wept. Boy, I think that's an understatement. To deny Jesus, forsaken Jesus, he bowed down and he prayed and he wept. Verse, chapter 15, look with me in, in verses 1 to 15. You see, Jesus is put on trial before Pilate. See, the, the Jews had no right under the Roman to, to actually put someone to death for these charges, but, but Rome could make that decision. And so the Sanhedrin bring Jesus before Pilate. The only problem is when Pilate questions Jesus, he can't find out that, Je find that Jesus has done any wrong. Worthy of death, he can't find out that he's done anything wrong other than he claims to be the king of the Jews, uh, which is not enough to put him to death. But Rome had a custom that every year, uh, just before the Passover, they would release a Jewish prisoner uh, to kind of keep the people happy. And um, the, uh, the Sanhedrin asked uh, Pilate, if he would keep that tradition, he said, yes. He gave him two options. He said, I've got two prisoners here. We've got Barabbas, who's an insurrectionist. He's a murderer. He probably killed a Roman while refusing to follow r the Roman law. Often these guys are considered uh, heroes. And he said, I've got this insurrectionist and a murderer, Barabbas, or I've got Jesus, who claims to be the king of the Jews. The, the chief priest stirred up the crowd to say, Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Release Barabbas. And Pilate was stunned, and he says, well, what am I supposed to do with Jesus then? And again, the, the chief priest stirred up the crowd to say, crucify him. Crucify him. 
which was the worst possible death. Pilate says, why? Why would you have Jesus crucified? What, is, what wrong has he done? But the crowd started yelling louder and louder, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, kill him. So Barabbas is released, and Jesus was flogged and handed over to be crucified. Now, I, I will point out that in Mark's gospel, Mark has a way of, of understating what Jesus went through. And every reader in this time would have known what that means when he's flogged and sent off to be cru crucified. But um, uh, often today we don't. To be flogged was to be stripped naked, or at least mostly naked, usually naked, and whipped across the back. But not only just the back, but the, the shoulders, the ribs, the arms, the legs, whatever they hit was okay. The whip was uh, consisted al almost like, like cables uh, that had bits of, of bone or metal in it that would grab the flesh and rip with each hit. The Jews had a rule that no one should have to endure 40 lashes of such a, uh, a hit, uh, such a, a whip, but the Romans had no such limit. And so this flogging could go on and on and on if they wanted it to. Jesus was beat. Jesus was beaten beyond our imagination. A medical doctor once described the last few lashes uh, of uh, this flogging to say, finally, the skin of his back is hanging in long ribbons. The entire area is an unrecognizable mass of torn, bleeding tissue. Victims rarely survived a Roman flogging, but Jesus did. And so, as Mark says, they prepared him to be crucified. They flogged him, and they prepared him to be crucified. Read with me in, Rome, or sorry, in, in Mark chapter 16, sorry, Mark chapter 15, verses fi 16 to 20. Mark chapter 15, verses 16 to 20. It's about... Jesus uh, being taken off to be crucified. Mark chapter 16. Oh, goodness, sorry. Mark chapter 15, verse 16. Mark chapter 15, verse 16. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on, him, on his back. Then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. They began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff, and they spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe, and they put on his own clothes, and they led him off to crucify him. The whipping of Jesus took place in public view, but here the soldiers take Jesus away to more of a private courtyard. Then they call in all the other soldiers, and they start to mock him. They take a robe, probably one of their own Roman robes, uh, that had faded a little bit and was more of a, a purple color. This purple was a uh, color signifying uh, royalty. And they put this purple robe on Jesus' back, which was bare strips, remember, of, of, uh, of torn flesh. And they take... Uh, a crown of thorns, and they put on his head. Now, uh, it, it's commonly uh, ref believed that this is a spina Christi, which can easily uh, be made into a crown. It was probably more than likely something called a thorny nap, which, uh, which is very, very common in, in that area around Jerusalem, outside the gates of Jerusalem. Either way, it's something that could easily be bent into a crown. And it had long spikes. Many of them had spikes this long that, that went down into his head. Now, this was... Although it, it would have caused great pain, it's something that was probably not meant to cause pain, but uh, to just mock Jesus as a crown, mocking the king. And they struck him over and over with a wooden staff. They struck him over and over in the head with a wooden staff. Imagine that. And as they struck him, they mocked him. So tell me, which of us was it that hit you? And they mocked him and they mocked him. And then they bowed down. And paid homage, it says, a fake worship to this king. They couldn't imagine that this gentle, humble Jew was claiming to be a king. And they beat him, 
And they spat on him and they, they, they smacked him in the head with a, uh, this wooden staff. And then they took all this off of him, put his own clothes back, and then led him back into the public view to be crucified. They led him away to be crucified. We'll continue talking about the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus next week. But this Christmas, I want us to remember more than just a baby born in a manger, but to know that this baby is Jesus Christ, our Savior. He was sent by God to pay the price for my sin, for your sin. Isaiah 53, 4, the prophet says, He took up our suffering. He bore our pain by his stripes, by those lashes, by his wounds, we are healed. It was always God's plan. Ever since the fall of man, because God loves you, because God loves me, and he wants to spend eternity with us. Remember, Jesus went through all of this suffering so that you don't have to. Sin leads to death and to hell, but life, life that Jesus offers gives peace, love, forgiveness, eternal life with God because of God's love for you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for your awesome love for us in that you know us completely and yet you still forgive us completely. You heal us completely. You restore us completely. You save us completely. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of Jesus. May we celebrate that all in your love for us this Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I'm glad you were able to join us for this morning's service. During this week, our worship team had um, our last practice and sharing time for the year. And we were able to share things that we've learnt over this period, some of the things that we're going to take with us, and some of the things that we are happy to leave behind. It's been a bit of a year. Some of the things that came up were learning to be steadfast, to be faithful and to trust the Lord during these times. And it's been really encouraging to see how people have grown in their faith over this time. Our God can use something like a pandemic to teach us amazing stuff and to strengthen our faith. I hope that your faith is strengthened during this week. Thanks for being with us.